Welcome to the Hersey Podcast. I'm Caroline Elliott. The Hersey Podcast is a platform for the voices of all women. Each week, women of all ages, all perspectives, share personal stories, firsthand accounts, advice, and opinions. We elevate women's voices in order to connect and build community, which happens when what we hear resonates with who we are. Welcome to the Hersey Podcast. Maggie Batista is the author of cookbooks Food Gift Love and A New Way to Food and founder of Boston-based Eat Boutique, a food gift retail space and online resource for crafty cooks and DIY food fans. A daughter of Honduran immigrants, Maggie discovered that when she shared the personal story of her struggles with food in her second cookbook, her relationship with her fan base and clients deepened leading to an abundance that has enabled her to feel aligned with her values and to give back to the community that has supported her along her journey. Maggie now uses these experiences to guide business owners toward their own success with We Are Magic Studio. So what is We Are Magic Studio? We Are Magic Studio is a space for women or non-binary entrepreneurs to explore their magic and infuse it into their business in order for that business to better sort of serve and inspire their communities. I like to say that the project is sort of part thoughtful business techniques that are lifted from my startup experience um, and also part my realignment journey over the last many years, a journey that's been super focused on embodiment Um, including the full embodiment of my values. Um, So on We Are Magic, I launched my first offering, which is one-on-one coaching, um, an experience called the Alignment Course. And it's a three-month heart-centered program where entrepreneurs can make or remake their business aligned with their values. Um, I'll say I typically serve those probably in food and retail, hospitality, wellness, and service, though I'm open to all sorts of business modality professionals, and I do work with a lot of aligning nonprofits, too. Um, So the coaching experience is sort of my first offering, but there'll be other things that launch along the path of the business's development, but it was created as a space to explore the human in business. Well, I really like and connect with the sort of Pilates language of um, alignment and reform and realign. And there's something about the alignment of values that and it's interesting that you say when you you deal with startups, but you also start with businesses that are a little further along as well, right? Because I think it's it's it, as someone who starts a business, it's easy to say, okay, well, I'm just going to get started, and then you get advice from here and you get advice from there, and you start to move, and then all of a sudden you might look back and say, well, I'm doing fine, but this isn't what I really had intended, or this isn't, I don't really connect with this anymore. So I would say that most of my clients are entrepreneurs who've been in business for a few years. And during 2020, the craziness that is 2020, they felt that their business was a little bit out of sync with their growth in some way, or they weren't sure how to grow or how to grow in a way that felt really good to them because things in the world had changed dramatically. So yes, I'd say the majority of my clients are probably folks who are three to four years into their business, but I am also working with a lot of folks, you know, with a fresh new idea, trying to figure out how to do it in a most aligning way at the get-go. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And as you had mentioned, this is sort of an outgrowth of the startups that you have created in the past. This is, you know, you've done two successful uh, cookbooks, uh, as well as an online retail business, pop-ups, and, and you know so much that you have already done successfully. So when did you get the original idea to go into business? You know, we all, we went to college together, and so you start out, and you go, you know, work out in the world, and then at some point you say, okay, I'm going to, I would like to start a business. What, what was the inspiration, and then what made you actually do it? 
So I want to say first that I've always been interested in entrepreneurship. You know, as a teen, I'd follow the lives of profound, at the time, entrepreneurs, just as much as I'd follow like the latest heartthrob. So <laughs> I had pictures of Martha Stewart and Sumner Redstone up just alongside yes. others. Um, yeah. I probably don't think of them so much as profound now, just like humans who happen to excel in the capitalistic paradigm, but I drink up their every moves. Um, and my father also had a side business in addition to his full-time job. So I always had that example of someone who was trying to do something, someone who was trying to make something from nothing, um, while also still supporting the family in some way. Um, so I always had those examples. But I would say the moment that made me sort of take the first step was several years back, I want to say somewhere in the early 2000s, I had departed a hospitality business, a business that I'd felt undervalued me, and really, ultimately, I undervalued me in that engagement in some way. And I took six months off. What was to, a company that you had worked for? What was that? Someone I had worked for, yes. Someone I had worked for. And I took six months off to sort of settle into myself and figure out what I may want next. And it was probably my first time not working for an extended period of time. You know, I've worked since I was 14, always, and never really taken a break. So that time was sort of revelatory. And a few months in, I kept getting this inkling that the next step was to get back to writing. And I know this gets to entrepreneurship, but I kept thinking if people read what I write, maybe I could turn it into a business in some way. I'm not sure what it would be. This was probably, I'm thinking like 2007. And it was a time when sort of Twitter was just recently introduced to the world. And I remember putting some tweets out in the world and then, you know, people walking down the hall and seeing me and discussing them with me in real life. So I knew that, that maybe someone was interested and if maybe even they were just mildly interested, perhaps I could sort of build a business from that. And so I remember like physically like thinking those thoughts that perhaps I could put some words out there, some story out there. I had studied journalism, right, when I was back at BU. And then maybe that could emerge into a business, but I didn't know exactly what. I, I just had that feeling that the story would lead to the business in some way. Do you, know what, do you understand what I mean? Absolutely. So many people just start out that way with a business. It's a, they feel like they just sort of need to get started and don't really necessarily know where it's going and uh, just go. Yeah. And I um, felt like I had to follow the story. You know, the six months went by, I started a blog and I went back into tech. So I had a full-time job that I was doing, but I'd had those few months to kind of be like, okay, let's, let's start getting the story somewhere. Um, and let's see how it evolves over time. So it, it was what different. was the story that you wanted yes. to tell? Like, what was the thing that you felt was the message in the beginning? Well, at the time, <laughs> you know, maybe now I have more foresight, but, <laughs> but at the time I was thinking, I have this interest and this passion in small businesses, wherever we go, where, wherever I, we go, I'm in love with the sort of small business spirit and the experience and the branding and the development and everything that goes into making a small business. Um, the risk that's involved with it, all of it, I was sort of passionate about it. And I thought that if I could tell some of those stories from my travels, from um, my backyard, from whatever, from the region I lived in, that maybe a business would develop out of that. And it did, in fact, build out of that. Eventually, I started selling the goods made by many of the artisanal makers that I profiled. But I let it happen naturally and organically. I didn't necessarily have a plan yeah. at the start. So many people just kind of, as you say, get started and you just kind of see where it goes. That's where the realignment can be needed later on, right? Yes. Yes. But so yes. what did you need to get started? So the so you started with a blog and then you did a a food gift business. Yes. 
what was it that you needed to do to shift? So a blog is you know pretty self-contained to the to the extent that you can you can do a lot on your own. But at some point, if like once you get into food gifts, you need to start, I would imagine, start to, to bring in people, more people and partners and and things. What was it? What did you need to take your business to the next level? For Eat Boutique, the growth was entirely dependent on social media. Social media was not just the way I got people to the site and to the gifts that I sold, but it was also a way for me to meet the makers behind the gifts. So it became a tool in which I would build connection and relationship with them. I would meet meet a farmer on social media and we would talk a little bit and then I would take it offline and do an email communication and see if they made something that I wanted to feature in my shop. So I, I say social media really was the tool that um, that showed me now and I know is showing millions of entrepreneurs today that it's possible to get your business and your brand and your message out. But I used it more than that. I actually used it to bring on makers into my shop as well. How did you find, it's one thing when you have a passion and an interest in something and you want to just share that with the world. You put it out there into the universe. You start writing about it uh, in the blogosphere. And then how did you find the people to connect with you? How did you find your community? It's interesting. Like, I don't know if you, if you find your community or if your community finds you. Uh, and I think at the time, um, people just found me based on whatever I was talking about. Even then in 2007, 2008, 2009, the food blogging world was, was filled, filled with people who were writing stories and creating recipes and featuring artisans as well. But I'd say that every time I wrote something, I made sure that I shared it on all this social media that I was aligned with at the time. And people found me, you know, people um, resonated with the description of a jam or resonated with how I, you know, connected with the maker and how I um, spoke about their values in my stories. Um, Because for me, it was very important to really recognize everything that went into small business spirit, um, in essence. And so it wasn't just a great product. I was I was featuring, but it was also their values I was trying to highlight through the platform. And so at the time in the social media world, um, people were searching and would find those things. And also um, folks who read me shared me with other people. So I was really grateful that a lot of that happened organically. You know, it happened naturally. Yeah. And you were working at the time in the beginning, full full time elsewhere. So you didn't ha- feel like you had to, you didn't have the pressure on yourself to be hitting a certain number every month of readership and that would translate into something else. For the majority of the existence of Eat Boutique, my first business, I was working full-time jobs. And so the first few years, I let things happen naturally, you know, and I, I didn't set major goals. I might set some light intentions and say to myself, I hope this happens or I hope that happens. Um, So it wasn't until later in e-boutique land, especially when the books came out, that I started setting sort of grander goals and more firmer goals. You know, when I started doing markets and pop-ups in real life, and people were coming into spaces that I was creating, and I had to invest a lot more money into those spaces to create experiences, I'd say that's when I probably got more involved in the metrics and said, okay, I need this to happen. I need this many people, you know, in order to feature this much product, you know, so. Or to get sponsorships and things like that, or to to gain, if you just start promising a certain amount of participation or viewership. Correct. Yes. Yes. I think it got um, 
I'm not going to say it wasn't ever not serious because it was a passion, a real, real passion of mine that I was exploring. Um, but I think it got more concrete after the first few years of seeing what the potential could be. It got all the way so concrete that after the last market, let's see, I hosted pop-up markets for 25,000 guests um, over the course of years of doing pop-up markets, probably a dozen. So you, and by pop-up markets, do you mean going to festivals and, and having a, a, a pop-up market there? Or did you go, did, where, where, explain what you What I mean is I created the pop-up experience from scratch. So I would create an e-boutique pop-up market and I would forge the relationships to find the right spaces to do that in. I would bring the makers in. I would promote and market the event. Sometimes we sold tickets, sometimes they were free. And uh, I did all of that. And I think when I started creating those experiences, and, and it was probably 2015, it got so big. <laughs> I went all the way to 2015, where in 12 days, I think we had 8,000 attendees. And it was such a big event. I did it at a space um, on the Harvard University campus. Um, they gave me a building for a period of time. It, it got to that point that I was like, okay, this is, this is definitely more real. This is definitely more solid. Let's put some stuff into place and let's figure out if you can make this a more permanent space now. I, I think I actually ended up leaving tech in 2015 when that happened. And did you feel like you were able to risk getting loans or how did you find your capital? What, what risks did you need to take at that point? So that point was different than earlier, right? So when I did my first gift box, I took the money out of a paycheck or a savings account that I had from my, my job, right? Toward and put that toward the business. I think by the time I got to 2015 and I was hosting these markets, every market was a little different. Either I would have to find the money somehow from my own resources, um, my savings or my sales from the year before. And typically that's what I did. I looked at my sales and I figured out what I could spend on these market experiences or someone would pay me to do these markets. So a real estate developer or, or a university would say, hey, we need to activate this area and we need to hire someone to activate this area. Will you do that for us? And I'd say, sure. And here's how much money it would cost for me to actually activate this space for you. And I would take my e-boutique retail concept and put it in their building and they'd get a beautiful activation right? And they'd build a buzz around their neighborhood. And I got, you know, a space for a period of time for my business. How did they find you? I have to say, um, I wish I could tell you it was more, it was more like methodical than this. The entire growth of e-boutique happened through social media. That was it. You know, um, thousands of email subscribers, thousands of followers on social media. and real estate developers ended up finding me on social media. So now that now pop-up markets are sort of um, commonplace for real estate developers, they usually bring on a team of market activators who figure out how to like activate that building that's empty so someone will rent it. Um, this was before that time and they were looking for ways to place make in some way to bring people into a place and I was certainly connected because I was on social media and I was talking on a daily basis and they ended up finding me and then I ended up sort of cultivating relationships with them over time there's actually a few placemakers and real estate developers that I still work with today in various sorts of hospitality engagements but yeah it all happened organically and it was very aligning for a long time in that way, right? Like, because one person would find me and mention me to the next person. And then, you know, a thousand people would show up at a market and they'd mention me to more people. So it felt like it had a life of its own in some way. Going back to cookbooks for a minute, because I know a lot of listeners are, yeah. you know, cooking during the pandemic. And there may be people who are interested in creating a business surrounding food or new hobbies that they have um, developed over, over this period of 
downtime and self-reflection. So much has happened during the pandemic. The two cookbooks are different. The first about about food gifting, um, and then the second was more is more recipe based. First of all, so many people looking to to start you know write a cookbook would wonder how to you know find the publisher um, that sort of thing, but. More deeply than that, and connected to your new business venture, We Are Magic, what was it about those two children, if you can say, because, you know, we, we think so much about it, so much goes into them, and then we launch them, and then they're out in the world, and they take on a life of their own. What was the magic that you brought to both of those individual projects that was aligned with what with, with who you were at the time of, of writing those, or you wrote them f- four years apart. Is that right? So I wrote Food Gift Love in 2011, and it came out in, did it come out in 2013? No, it came out in 2015. Forgive me. That's how long it's been. I wrote Food Gift Love. Interesting that that took, took that long. Yeah, it takes, it takes about a, a year of Uh, proposal writing and cultivating that story into words and working with your agent. And I had an agent on both those books um, to get to the point of just getting before a publisher, right? And then from the time the publisher signs you, it takes about two years before the book is actually released, the cookbook is actually released. Um, That's not across the board how it happens with everyone but for many of my colleagues and friends and other authors uh, who are writing cookbooks with recipes and both those books were recipes that's typically how it happens Um, i'd say the first book that i wrote in 2013 that came out in 2015 was about the business i'd started Food Gift Love was about Eat Boutique more than anything. And it was recounting that experience and what I'd learned from that experience, including that I had learned to detect um, which foods really, you know, um, uh, tasted good and felt good to me um, by recreating them in my own kitchen. Um, So I would meet makers, I would learn how to make jams, and then I'd go home and I'd make jams like crazy. Um, So so that book was the story of that part of my life. And then and then you spend some time promoting a book, right? So 2015 and 2016 was spent promoting a book. Um, And A New Way to Food is a very different book in that um, it It probably is when I realized more so than any other time that I was writing these stories around food to reconcile my relationship with food in some way. And that book I wrote from 2017 on, I would say I probably wrote it in 2016 and 2017. uh, And, um, got it with a publisher and it came out in 2019. So it just came out two years ago. It's pretty fresh to the world. I mean, it's fresh to me still, but I think uh, uh, cookbooks have a a very short shelf life in general when they come out into the world in terms of the promotion that's put behind them in general. That book was also the story of the life I was living, no question. But I think in that book, I began to take a step back and started to say, okay, whoa, um, you know, why are you writing about food? I didn't say that exactly in the book. The book is really my health journey, but I think that book was more, why are you writing about food? What, what is it that's attracted you to this? I actually consider that book the beginning of, um, or the end of the beginning of my embodiment journey more than anything. Because for me, we all come to embodiment at different points. And for me, reconciling with food, that is sort of the greatest and toughest relationship of my life since I was a child. And so- Well, and many, many, many people. For many lives. people, exactly. Um, and so, Uh, that book was me being able to work some things out in some way. And I find that we're all different, right? But for me, um, 
my lessons are best told to myself um, through writing um, or, or through speaking and through sharing in some way. And so um, that book was a way for me to process the beginning of sort of reconciling with my relationship with food, but really getting into a place where I listened to my body a lot more. And I'd say it was probably the beginning of this new phase of my life where I'm working on embodied entrepreneurship um, because it let me get into my body more and start to feel it and feel things through my body rather than just thinking with my mind. Did you feel like it was a risk in a way to, to put yourself out there and be vulnerable to share those thoughts and feelings that you had had that had led you to that point in your life? I think we think, our mind thinks it's always a risk to share anything. Um, we fear shame. We fear embarrassment. Um, we fear, I think my, my fear is more at the time I was very worried about saying the wrong things and hurting other people's feelings through the process. But I, I don't get anywhere. I don't grow. I don't evolve without from at least at least trying and sharing and being vulnerable in some way. And it just so happens that I decided to share those vulnerabilities, you know, through a book. It, it could have been anything. I think it could have been anything, right? But I certainly worried that other people would take that book and make it about them in some way and project what they were feeling on it in some way. And I think, I think some people do, uh, and that's okay. But I am sort of consistently dedicated to my own evolution. You know, I'm consistently dedicated to figuring out how to stay in alignment and how to sort of um, be uh, the highest version of myself. And so I couldn't shy away from that. It just... It just wouldn't feel right to not say some of those things. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You, it sounds like you really know yourself. And that you have been able, you know, somehow in your life to be, you know, quiet with yourself enough so that you can really hear or feel those, those pullings in one way or another. You can really feel when you're in alignment. Because if, if, if you start getting too intellectualized, sometimes if you think too much, then it's, it, it's hard to, to, I, I imagine, and you, you can speak more about this with when we talk about uh, We Are Magic Studio, but you, that it's, it seems like it's very easy for any of us entrepreneurs, but any of us to get in our own way because we start thinking too much about process maybe and not enough about what, what feels right to us to express or to, to give out to the world in some way. And I, I think that's the real work, right? You know, I think the real work for us is to get to a place in our lives, and, and I feel like I say this now with what X number of decades of wisdom <laughs> or experience more than anything, is to get to a place in our lives where we feel as much as we think or more so than we think, and we can fully take in um, what's happening and, and not just do for the sake of doing, that we can get to a place where we can um, really sort of uh, feel into it. And yes, I feel like We Are Magic Studio sort of talks about <laughs> and addresses this part. You know, the constant work of my life is trying to, I'm eternal seeker of alignment. You know, every day I'm a seeker of alignment now. That is my work. Um, my work is not, how am I going to make money today? You know, my work is, how am I going to get aligned today? Because the money will come from that you know, and, and that's a real shift in perspective that happened and took me time to get to. And, and I'm sure there'll be lots of other shifts that happen as I grow up, <laughs> as I continue to grow up, right? Absolutely. Uh, when you wrote your second, your second cookbook, New Way to Food, did you find that you had acquired a new audience? Like, were there people who maybe, you know, weren't, oh, maybe they even weren't aware of, of of your food endeavors, but were interested in, in your story and the relationship with food. Did, we, did you, did you find a new, 
a new message to bring out in the world besides just besides recipes and the artisans that you were working with who, who brought specialty foods but but now it's it's your journey and um and then connecting with others who may have been feeling the same way or have had similar struggles did you find that now you your audience grew or changed or evolved or expanded I think I just went deeper with my audience in some way. You know, I, I wouldn't say, I, I, I felt like the readers of my first book, um, right, but they all loved food gifts. They loved the idea of giving food gifts, um, certainly. But the message of sort of reconciling the relationship with your body and the relationship with food is a universal one. And so it really... Um, sort of I, that book, I think, created a space for us to just go deeper and to get to know each other a little bit better. Do you know, do you understand what I mean? Like, yeah. um, certainly there were people who are health focused who were into the book, but, um, but, and I was really interested in the people who had been along for the food gift love ride and who were finding sort of a new way to um, connect with, you know, my content, um, this story on a deeper level. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah. that's what I think. It, absolutely. Eat Boutique is on Eat Boutique is right closed. Now. It's closed completely. Yeah. Not, okay. And did that close in any way surround, because as a result of the pandemic? No, actually. Um, uh, it was a gift that Eat Boutique closed before the pandemic <laughs> in some ways. Yeah, so I was actually in 2019 sort of on the precipice of, of finally, after four years of searching, about to sign a lease on a permanent space to make a boutique a permanent food retail space, like with a brick and mortar building. Um, but as I got closer and closer to signing that lease, literally like the week of signing that lease, it was, it was spring of 2019, um, the more my body and the universe showed me that this was not my path any longer. Um, like literally the, si the week of the signing of the lease, so many things happened around me that in my body, I kept feeling like, whoa, this, this maybe was you four years ago, but this is not you now. This is not aligning. And certainly, if it was aligning, you know, I would have pushed through and get that lease signed and gone into hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt to get that space open. But my body began to feel and tell me directly that it was time to pause and reconsider if this is what I wanted. And so I feel like it was a gift that my body got involved <laughs> and said, okay, we are not going to sign this lease. You are not going to get a space open. I was technically going to have this space open in 2020, in early 2020, um, right around when the pandemic sort of closed in on all of us. So I feel like it was a gift for me to focus on me and not how I was going to pay back that money, not how I was going to make money to make more money. Instead, you know, I had more time during 2020 to get into my body and and reconsider like what I had to offer and what new way I was going to do that and to create a new space to do that, which is We Are Magic. So what was it that led you to We Are Magic Studios? What was the process? So you had closed, uh, e e closed in your mind, <laughs> e-boutique as a, as a concept and a future business uh, venture uh, and took some time off. What was it that made you say, now I'm going to do this as a business. It's not, you know, I'm just going to start writing. It's now this is a business. I'm getting, I am providing a service to clients. This is, this is a business now. What, what was it that led you to decide that that was your next, your next focus? So I had taken some time off after that sort of not, not committing to that space. Um, and after taking a few months off, I decided to take on a new project. So I took on a hospitality venue and I took the sort of first project that came my way and felt aligning enough, you know, um, and I worked on that project, you know, to keep 
I was like, I'm going to keep your mind focused. We're going to get you on a project and just let you do something. But while I was, was doing that project, um, while I was sort of recovering from not signing that lease and wondering like what had happened, I had also been doing things that I, I had never really talked about with the world. You know, I never really talked about aloud outside of myself. I had been studying consciousness, um, literally taking classes and studying consciousness. I'd been studying the brainwave states and where they go when you're asleep and awake and all the other different types of processing. I had been doing inner voice dialogues. I'd been practicing embodiment through yoga and meditation. So I'd been doing all these practices and they were sort of a, a, a savior, a saving grace at that time. But that inner work sort of led me to do more inner work, <laughs> to take, you know, more tiny moves, not big sweepy moves and big decisions, but tiny moves to, to get more and more in my body and to do more and more journaling, to do more and more meditation. And We Are Magic actually came to me specifically over a series of meditations um, where I was really doing some work to consider what I had to offer. Like, what could I contribute? What do I do? What do I offer? Um, and so you have this layer of like going and doing all this embodiment work and you have this project here that's occupying your mind, which is great. You need your mind to be occupied. <laughs> and then um, I was doing this work over here to figure out, okay, what's the next thing that I do? Let's sort of meditate. Let's journal. Let's sort of get very introspective. Let's do a lot of self inquiry. Um, and I waded through all of that to rediscover what my body really wanted. And, and We Are Magic came to life. It came to life as a space for myself and for others um, to learn about the concept of sort of staying in alignment as a human, not just in alignment. Um, I know various modalities, like you said, Pilates and yoga, everybody talks about that. Um, for me, it means really staying peaceful and in line with your, your values um, and using that work to guide you through entrepreneurship, to take you through entrepreneurship. Well, I, I think that's so important because anyone starting a business, it's there's the thing that makes you want to do it in the first place. It's a, usually you're, it's connected to some sort of passion, but then at some point, um, as you said, over time, at some point, you need to think about the numbers and the metrics, and that can start to lead you in another direction. And it's, it seems so important, the work that you're doing, that you're offering now uh, with We Are Magic Studio to have people continue that process of evaluating, is this, is this what I'm supposed to be doing? Is this aligning with who I am, who I want to be? I think it's natural for us to fall into the sort of old mode of saying, okay, in order to be successful, I need this number of X and this number of Y and this number of Z. And I have to watch what other people have done and replicate it in some way. And no judgment. It's natural for us to do that as humans. <laughs> it's all fine. Um, but I just wanted to I sort of inadvertently, unknowingly was taking a different approach and it really worked for me. And certainly I, you know, I have goals and I, I love being in the middle of spreadsheets. Um, I think it's very fun to do all that work. Um, but I don't let it lead my business. I don't let it lead my life anymore. Um, it's just sort of a different approach to entrepreneurship that I'd like to share. I'd like to, you know, um, I think so many of us have felt we are wrong in some ways in the way we might do entrepreneurship. Um, uh, you know, we uh, don't feel comfortable with some of the paths that we've seen other people take and we want to find a new path. And so We Are Magic was a new path for me. What was the best advice you received along your journey to, uh, to, 
not even necessarily to achieve the success that, that you have achieved, um, you know, to be able to launch another business. You've had these cookbooks and um, your successes along the way. What what advice did you receive, not only to, to have successful businesses, but but just to you know, that maybe help to shape your um, your mission and, and your and your um, your purpose with We Are Magic Studio. Um, I would say I have two things that always ring through my mind, and they are um, bits of advice from my first yoga teacher, who is sort of a prolific Iyengar teacher. Her name is Karen Stephen. And the first one is the first step, the one that's right in front of you, is the most important step. And she's also said to me, you don't have to do much to do much. And both of those sort of break down change and transformation into tiny steps, tiny bites, little victories. So we all grasp, or at least I was able to grasp, that change happens just as it happens at our own pace. There is no sort of rule around us that says you have to have an instant transformation. You know, you have to lose all that weight tomorrow. I wish I had known these bits of advice as that fat kid, right, wrestling with how to lose weight fast, the same weight every year of my youth. And I know the advice has come from a yoga teacher, but I really do think it applies to business too. You know, I believe that having a long-term business strategy is awesome. I call it a blueprint, you know, and a blueprint is a drawing, right, of what, what, may come to life. Um, so I call it a business blueprint, what your business may do, how your business may grow. But just like you build a business or let's say you take a blueprint and you build a house with that blueprint, along the path of building, you're going to discover new things about the structure. You're going to find new challenges to work around. You're going to come up with new ideas that you really, really want to find a home for in your house. And I find that a blueprint sort of provides a nice framework for understanding business in this new age that, you know, you could certainly map out all the possibilities, but the human <laughs> behind the business must constantly check in with themselves, must stay in alignment, may have to pivot and grow organically as the time and the moment and the customer or even the business asks of it. And I feel like, you know, these, these sort of tiny bits of wisdom to take things um, in a measured way um, is invaluable in how I am growing We Are Magic Studio. And I wish I had learned it at a younger age. We, we put so much pressure on ourselves to have it all figured out beforehand. And if it just doesn't, you can't have it all figured out. And, and as things like you said, as things evolve, as times change, we just witnessed an Im immense period of change. And you have to know whether it's, it's the right time to pivot or make, you know, complete changes. And um, yeah, the, that, like you said, it's nice to have the, the big picture in mind, but you can't take action on the big picture all, all the time. You have to also see these, the road right in front of you. What do you wish you had known earlier in your in your in your career trajectory that you know now? Um, well, I think that goes along with like some of the worst advice I've received. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yes. So uh, the first part is I received the advice at a very young age never to show my emotions. And that your emotions are a reflection uh, that should not be shared with the world, certainly not in a business paradigm. But I think your emotions are a reflection of what your body's feeling. I think feeling and sharing should be allowed in entrepreneurship with no shame. Certainly, like nowadays, I do a lot of work to stay in my equanimity, you know, to stay in alignment. Um, but I, I really have released any beliefs that there's a wrong way of being in front of someone else, like a coworker or an employer. 
I believe that our soft sides are our best sides. And I think that's what I wish I had known earlier in my journey, that that our soft sides are our best sides because they hold our truth and our authenticity. And I wish I hadn't wasted time feeling shame or regret for what I really felt deep inside for how passionately I chose to st- to share those feelings, you know? So um, I wish I'd known that. And there's one other bit I'll share with you. Um, I wish I'd known that abundance was so multifaceted as a young person in startup tech. Like, I certainly think I had to learn all my money lessons, and I learned many of them very harshly and directly, as many people do. Uh, That's a story for another day. But (laughs) I wish us all the ability to, like, see through what classic entrepreneurship espouses and make up our own rules or have no rules at all and to see abundance in very different ways, not just the money we make for ourselves, but perhaps see it as the money we make for other people or for people in crisis, or perhaps see it as the time we get to give to people in crisis or to our family or to our friends or to our community. And I am, um, I really encourage that. Certainly I encourage Um, having spreadsheets and going through costs and understanding income and figuring out pro formas, all that stuff is really, really helpful. But I don't know if that's what builds a true embodied business these days. I think that looking at abundance in very different ways um, is more important to me now and I wish, I wish I had told my 20-something self that, that, you know, money is going to be important. You're going to need it. But there are other things that are equally and far more important. Well, the success of um, A New Way to Food, in comparison to, to your first book, I think, you know, they're, you know, incredible, both successful books. But as you said earlier, you know, that ability to go deeper with your audience, with your customers, with your clients, with everybody that you are in contact with your community, um, that deepens that relationship. And everything about that, you know, is, you know, part of that, the idea of who you are, you know, and, and showing your emotions is part of that, that special, that which makes your business special when you can share who you are and all of the, um, the history of your life, that's that's part of what makes us, what could make, you know, one person's business different from another person's business that provides the same product. It's that story that we all have to share, um, and that you know connection with, um, you know, what you provide. That is, you know, whether it's a, you know, it, it, again, going back to what you said about abundance, it's you know, it's not the money, it's you know, having that business that is nourishing for you in a, in a way that's beyond the money that you make that you can spend on other things, but that being able to contribute in other ways through you know, helping other you know, people and organizations and helping your giving back to your community. It's, it's such a, a well-rounded sort of way of approaching a business and helping you to feel successful, even if you're not, you know, making millions of dollars, but, you know, it's, it's sort of putting a, a different focus on what success can mean to you and to not put so much pressure on the dollar amount, but on how is what you're doing fulfilling to you? I mean, how is, how is what you're doing fulfilling to you? How is what you're doing helping this planet, helping the collective in some way, if that matters to you, you know, so no judgment. If the millions of dollars is what you want, great. You know, that's amazing. Um, but if making millions of dollars to help people in crisis is another path that's interesting to you, then let's talk about that. Or if like having millions of seconds to have new experiences and travel is another path, let's talk about that too. I like to say that like abundance is like a gem. It's multifaceted. So you want to look at every side of it. And yeah, I, I, wish, I wish we talked about that more. So I'm talking about it <laughs> in my business. 
Okay, Maggie, how can our listeners learn more about We Are Magic? So if they'd like to learn more, they can go to um, wearemagic.studio. And on that website, there's everything about my business and all my product offerings. And there's more about me and my transformational journey. Um, and uh, I also be releasing a podcast soon called We Are Magic. So they'll be able to look for that soon and start hearing audio to support their embodied entrepreneurship journey. Very cool. And they can check you out. Everybody can check you out on, on Instagram as well. That's right. I am on Instagram as Ms. M-I-Z Maggie B currently, though that could change. Um, and We Are Magic Studio is also on Instagram at wearemagic.studio. I see some great um, videos there, IGTV videos as well. So I've already been learning quite a bit there. So, all right, Maggie Batista, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Herse podcast. This episode of She Succeeded and You Can Too was produced by Caitlin White with assistance from Caroline Dean. You can learn more and share your own voice with us at hersepodcast.com. The Herse Podcast is a production of CPM Omnimedia.